What is up everyone? Today is the post season two Demon Slayer Q&A. Season two really ended off in a high note. I'm still sort of buzzing from the ending. I went back and watched some of the animation just for fun. There are a lot of questions, so let's just get right into it. Mia Nozielski asks, who is your favorite of the trio? Which trio do you relate to the most? And who had the most growth? These are all really difficult questions. Favorite is especially tough. I'm gonna give it a tie between Tanjiro and Inosuke. Tanjiro because of his will and drive and just general goodness and always thinking about others and putting them first. But I think more personally to me and answering your second question about relating to them is what I think was developed really nicely in season two that made me appreciate his character a lot more and I think gave him some much needed depth, which is that it's not all just him being unbelievably good. I mean, he is unbelievably good, but part of it is him trying to reconcile and find a way to act through something he doesn't understand and doesn't really know how to cope with, which is the loss of his family. It's pretty interesting and also relieving to me how they did it because season one, you know, there's this unbelievably tragic beginning and then boom, we're on the journey and Tanjiro is just doing his thing, right? But season two, especially with the Mugen Train arc, it kind of catches up to him a little bit. He's a chance to reflect on the fact that he never really coped with it. I mean, I, I would say to this point, he hasn't coped with it. Instead, he took that energy and that sadness and that rage and focused it all on what he could do. And that was to start to try to revert Nesco back to human form because she's the one remaining family member he has left but in the process, also realizing that there was a lot of good he could do and that the people who are suffering at the hands of the demons were very much like himself. Underpinning all this is just a general goodness he has and a general empathy that other people around him, everyone he sees, even people who he doesn't even know, are just as human as, as he is. And so there's a strong connection to others that comes from a deep understanding, I think, of humanity that allows him to have sympathy even for his enemies. You know, even in the Mugen Train arc, I think one of the best moments is when someone tried to kill him or the person who put him into a, a dream or whatever it was, he averts death partly because he doesn't want to make the other person a murderer. I mean, who thinks like that? But back to the relating part, for me, I feel like I'm always, always out ahead of my skis. I don't have a hundredth of the strength that Tanjiro has, but I think for a long time in my life, I was highly anxious and would be defeated pretty easily. And a lot of the time I was defeating myself. But one thing I've really taken away from these shows, and I think I've kind of incorporated to a certain degree, which I'm, I'm really happy about, is I've gotten better about acting through it. Or when it goes really well for me, it becomes energy. It becomes motivation to do things that otherwise I, I might not be able to do. And then there's a sort of faith in there somewhere that if I just do the right things, if I am process oriented and have faith, even if I can't see or imagine or believe in, let's say, a positive outcome, just to take the steps anyway and see if they'll be there. And a lot of times they are there. And then also in this case, just because he's sort of understated in his greatness. You know, he comes across as this wild beast man and he's very loud in the beginning, but there's a lot of depth there. There's an introspection happening that's not put into dialogue, really. It's sort of in his actions and how you see him change through his behavior. Becoming a team player, looking out for Tanjiro, being very competitive, but that competition being largely with himself, just because he's very driven and connected to life. I really like that about him. Like Tanjiro, there's also a lot of heart in him. And he's also hilarious. And then, of course, I relate to the fact that he can never remember anyone's name, which is something that has plagued me throughout my life and these reaction videos. So for most growth, I would say Inusuke as well. Tanjiro has had a lot of growth, but he started off sort of in a pretty solid place, I He's already the savior of the town, right? Tying everyone's shoelaces for them. His growth to me seems like him pushing himself farther and faster along a trajectory he was already sort of on, sort of accelerated by circumstance, whereas in this case, it feels like his character has made a radical turn at some point by meeting people. And Nirban Rei asks, both Tengen and Rengoku wanted Tanjiro as their Tsukugo. If Rengoku was alive, who would Tanjiro have chosen? I think that Rengoku was deliberately made as a counterpoint to Tanjiro, so I think that Rengoku would have been the one. They have a similar sort of no-nonsense, no-distraction, good-heartedness focus to life and other people, and service. Tengen, of course, also has that. I mean, pretty much all the characters have the same things, it's just a matter of degree. And I think that Tengen is a little bit more focused focused on his immediate surroundings and his family and his wife specifically. Then you also add the fire parallel and it seems like a match made in heaven, which was perfect design if they were going for tragedy, considering that it was cut short because I think all the anticipation was there of them being master pupil. It was just such an obvious, great, glorious opportunity lost. Algar Frank asks, what do you expect from other Hashiros, especially Love and Serpent? Serpent had sort of a weird, weird cameo in the end of season two where he kind of shows up and is admonishing them for doing the unbelievably momentous task of destroying an upper rank demon. But if we're following the trend, none of the Hashiros really got introduced that well. It was only through their single focus that we really got to see them shine and go to love them. I didn't have the best impression of Tengen at first either, but obviously by the end of season two, he's amazing. So assuming the show continues to deliver on that Hashira goodness, I'm expecting he's going to be great, if perhaps a little rough around the edges. I think that all of the, the Hashira so far have had something really important to contribute for the characters. To sum up Rengoku's contribution, it was set your heart ablaze, even though the concept is so much bigger than those words. For Tengen, I would say it's Bonds. That was borne out by him to some degree. I think it was also borne out largely by the events of season two, where we see, or at least it feels to me like the three 
primary characters are closer to each other than ever before through his influence. And I don't think that's an accident. I think that was very much a, a big part of the final part of season two. There was also an element of Tengen that was not just heart, but strategy. He's more of a tactician, you know, where Rengoku has this big flame dragon attacks. Tengen is about poison and bombs and things like that. I don't know what exactly to expect from Serpent, but I can take a guess and say it might be things related to personal strength, independence, getting the job done, focus maybe, and for love, maybe an exploration of warmth. I think there's something in Tanjiro that's really interesting, speaking of him, <laughs> which is that he has been kind of in conflict with the whole demon slaying thing because he's naturally very understanding and forgiving and loving, but is forced to kill. And I think that is very much going to be a central part of his character journey where he has to learn how to reconcile the two. As I've said in videos, I think that's kind of what people recognize in him, that he has something unique to contribute. That's Tanjiro's contribution, perhaps, is this really profound understanding of other people that gives him the ability to be so self-sacrificial in a wholesome way. So maybe the love Hashira will start to be an exploration of that side of his character a little bit more. Whoops, I see that actually it's Mist, not Serpent. So for Mist, I think he's the one who was able to become a Hashira in like 24 hours or something like that. So that's going to be talent, right? Or skill. Reaching new heights of ability, maybe. Or focus or something like that. Just a guess. Athena asks, what will your breathing technique be and which breathing technique did you find the most awesome? This is tough, but for me, out of the ones I've seen, I'm going to choose Inuske's Beast Breathing. It's not the flashiest, but I like sort of the wildness of it. It's sort of unpredictable, has sort of a raw energy feel, which I think fits me better than any of the other styles I've seen. Also because it's linked to touch, right? And maybe as an offshoot of that, sight. And I would say that out of all my senses, smell is the weakest. So there goes Tanjiro and sound also not the best. But as far as which was the most awesome, I would think that consistently I'm always the most blown away by Zenitsu. I think every time he pulls it out of the bag, it's an experience. Water is also beautiful. Maybe it's sort of been diluted, no pun intended, by the fact that we've just seen so much of it. Zenitsu feels like a treat every time he, he does his technique. And then I'm going to give a runner-up, and I'm only giving it runner-up because it was only once. But that scene with Tengen's sound breathing was phenomenal. I also think there's something to Tengen's about being one of the most effective. You know, if you can read people's movements, I feel like that does something that just raw power can't do. Rocio Sotelo asks, what are your theories about how the character development will take upon the main trio after the Entertainment District events. The most exciting thing to me about this is the fact that they are all super bonded now. I think for, for most of the first season, it felt like they were kind of this rough association of travelers, right? They were split up. They weren't really working as a trio. They were at odds with each other. In a way, Tanjiro seemed kind of distant from them to a certain extent. Zenitsu was insulted by their actions and leaving it behind, but everything changed with Rengoku, where they shared a similar trauma, and from then on, there was no going back, and that got even better with the finale of the Entertainment District arc, because they were all crucial in that event, and they all watched each other bleed and almost die for each other and for the, the cause. So that is such a deep bond that from now on, they're going to be a unit, I feel. Also, I think all of them now got a little taste of victory, right? They've gotten a taste of intense pain. They've, they've got all the way down with the beginning of season two. And now they've gotten the idea that, wow, actually, maybe we can pull this off. And if they had any doubts about their path or demon slaying before or their importance, that's probably gone. And so what's left for them to do is just get really good, you know, get better. I can imagine them all being a little bit more humble now under the Hashira and studying harder, learning harder, practicing harder because now it's not just something that they're kind of doing because this is the path we're on. No, this is life now. This is everything. Individually, as I said before, I think Tanjiro isn't fully authentic yet, if that makes sense. I mean, he is, but there's some way he can take his base personality and his greatest gifts and apply that to the tradition and culture of the Demon Slayers and become the fully realized Tanjiro that is sort of the path of the protagonist that I think other people have noticed about him. To be the greatest, not just in a Hashiro way, but in a Tanjiro being a Hashiro way, if that makes sense. For Indusuke, it's the rounding out of his personality. I guess it's actually similar in a sense because it's taking those raw beast wild elements, but having it be connected connected to something greater, having structure, having a purpose. And for Zenitsu, it's probably courage. It's not being so hesitant, learning to act through fear. Rain asks, what do you think Nezuko's arc will look like? Interesting. Yeah, speaking of character growth, the Entertainment District arc to me suggested that Nezuko is not just the thing that launches the journey for Tanjiro or the person who he's escorting, right? Which is sort of how it felt to me at points in season one. It feels to me now like she's going to be essential. There's a dual path for them that's shared where Tanjiro is going to be essential because of who he is innately, but Nezuko also seems to be a, a key piece of the equation, probably because of her demon slaying powers. And I'm wondering how that connects thematically. And it might be similar to Tanjiro in, in the sense that as your comment points out, she had flashbacks in this episode and she also largely appeared in Tanjiro's flashbacks or visions or whatever they were 
so there's going to be something thematically with her as well, right? She's part of the emotional core of what's going to happen with the characters too. I don't know what it'll be exactly, but I'm excited that it might be her actually becoming a fully fleshed out character, hopefully with dialogue, that she will actually have an arc at all and have growth and be able to become a part of the main story and become part of the, the trio into a quartet. Willem asks, can you share a Taisho era secret of your own? I feel like I don't have a really great one, so I'll throw out a few. My family and myself are huge cat lovers. We have a sore spot for, for rescues. As a kid, there was a point where I had 14 cats in my house. I have a cat now, as a lot of you know, and he was a rescue. And I travel, which makes it really <laughs> difficult, but he will be traveling with me to every country I plan on living in long term. He's right next to me, as always. A channel-related Taisho secret, for those who have started watching the channel after Legend of Korra, you may have noticed my friend Melon Lord slash Sweater Lord in the background here. He was a result of skits that I did about fruit people that started with people complaining about my blank white background, not that that has improved much. Talk about a flat arc, but he's met God and communicated with the cosmos and everything. A lot of people ask me if I changed the watermelon or replaced them, but part of the arc was that he gained permanent form or more permanent form than an actual watermelon. It was a, a real watermelon in the beginning. Now it's some kind of um, synthetic watermelon, probably some kind of hard styrofoam. He also travels with me in every country I go to. <laughs> for those who are real fans of Fruit Saga, for the three of you out there, you may remember Cabbage Bro. He also lives in Korea, but he is currently staying with a friend of mine. He lives at my friend's house. A childhood secret that I don't think I've ever said before. I won an official Nintendo Pokemon Game Boy tournament tournament when I was 11 or 12. And then a random one that comes to mind because I was talking about it the other day. I was once the main suspect in a missing persons case because I was the last person to see someone who disappeared. And it was rough for a bit because some of the people around me believed I was responsible. But thankfully that was all cleared up when the person showed up and cleared my name. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk about myself. <laughs> Nick asks, which demon do you like the most? Is the most interesting one to you? Hard to say I like any of them. If I have to pick, I'll go outside of the villain camp and go with Nezuko just because she's so kawaii. The most interesting one is definitely the brother demon in the entertainment district arc. Just because of the fact that his his backstory is so tragic and goes so deep that it's almost impossible not to be like, okay, yeah, I, I can sort of see how you can end up there. If we're taking demons typically as a descent into darkness and using non-wholesome, non-Tanjiro-like things as a way of coping or living or surviving or winning, his is kind of like, yeah, that would make you like that most for most people. Also, I think it was really well done, even if it's not the strongest connection, I feel like there's something there where there's a parallel between him and Tengen because both of them have really difficult childhoods, both of them have odd relationships with siblings, but Tengen went a very different way. And it's sort of like, why is that? And I think the why can next to what is probably a broader theme of the show. Actually, come to think of it, I don't even know why I'm going there first. A more obvious parallel is with him and Tanjiro Nezuko, who obviously went a very different path. Lana asks, what do you think of Gyu as a character? Thoughts on his promise to commit seppuku if Nezuko were to bite a human? Do you think this will be an issue later in the show? I really like what we've seen of Gyu so far, not just because he's powerful and stoic and cool, but because you can tell there's something really deep to him. Just judging solely by the fact that he's a Hashira and has made Hashira his whole life, yet that's not what defines him. There's still something else that's deeper than that. That is him looking, he's observing life, and he noticed something in Tanjiro, took a huge risk on him that continues to be a risk, but did it in such a way where he made himself fully responsible for that decision. So there's so much in there at once. It's him being awesome and powerful and successful, very accomplished, but him not being too attached to that, being a free thinker, but not doing it flippantly being someone who will back it up. I don't know how to explain it, but I get this really interesting and intriguing sense from him that he's kind of given up on certain things. He is who he is and he is on the path he's on, but it feels to me like he has a sense of his own limits and he sees something in Tanjiro that he doesn't think he has in himself. And so he's putting faith in that. He's putting faith in something that is perhaps higher than him in a sense, in his mind, which also ends up being a really humble type thing. So there's sort of no doubt that he's very aligned with real vision and real conviction. About if it were to become an issue, I think we will see his faith in Tanjiro and Nezuko be rewarded, but I do think it will continue to be a threat. Nezuko is getting more and more powerful, that's been established, but her power is one that is thematically connected to darkness, and so there's going to be a constant trade-off between what she can accomplish and how much she can help them and protect them and how compromised she is until probably it gets to a point where there's some key realization that harmonizes the elements. Sean Wilson asks, could you see Tanjiro developing a love interest or would that take away from the focus of familial love? I actually got that sense from Kanao, was her name? They feel like a great match, actually. That felt like more than just two Tsugoku or two trainees. There's something about them that feels right and I think that is represented by the fact that Tanjiro already has been a, a big contributor to her life and outlook. 
There's something about her that Tanjiro needs, as represented by the fact that she was so far above them when they arrived. And there's something Tanjiro has that she needs, which is maybe freedom, self-conviction. And that already creates a nice recipe for romance, I think, in a way that would be not just, well, here's a guy, here's a girl, they fall in love, but something actually connected to what I feel are actually some of the greatest and most beautiful elements of romantic relationships, which is mutual growth. Big Head asks, do you have any complaints about Demon Slayer? So I do have some, but I think that was especially present in season one, and season two kind of addressed a lot of them already. I think that season two added a lot of depth that showed that it wasn't just character tropes like Heart of Gold and The Loud One, right? It's so much more than that. The characters are so much more rich to me now than when I started, which I guess is probably obvious. But season two really did a lot for the character development, I think. My other complaints are all going to be minor. I think one thing that comes up sometimes is some of the characters, especially the villains, seem to be one note. One thing that I, I kept fixating on was Ball Demon. She kept saying, I'm having so much fun. I'm having so much fun. There was something about that that was a little bit on the nose. And I can't remember other examples, but I've felt that come up a few times. It just feels like whatever the villain is or whatever, Whatever their compulsions are, they really drill that. You know, they drill that behavior or line or whatever it is. And on a related note, I think that sort of becomes more understandable and more relatable when we get their backstory, but we we always get them too late. I think it would be interesting. I'm not sure it would be better. I just, I'm curious how it would land. If we got the backstory for them before they died, I'm sure some of you have played the game Metal Gear Solid 4. I feel the same way about the villains that I felt about the, what were they called? There's three girls in that game where you, you fight them and then you get their their backstory. And I'm, I'm sure that 50% of people who play that game skip that because it's like, I just defeated this villain. What do I, what do I care about who they are? To have some sort of stakes in the villain before hand would make the fight a little bit more dynamic, I think, a little bit more engaging and would make them feel less flat during the fight. In the Entertainment District arc, Brother Demon's backstory is actually great. It was surprising me. I'm like, we don't need this backstory, but I'm grateful for it because it rounded out his character. And it's like, yeah, as I've said, it's sort of hard to imagine him not becoming that way. So it's like, okay. And, and also that gives him a chance for redemption, right? By realizing things that he he didn't know and grudges he had and anger he had about the world, focusing on his bond with his sister. They had this great ending. What would it have been like if that conflict, that inner conflict was there earlier rather than sort of packaged in all at once? And then another minor gripe is I really like them pulling it out of the bag. I really like them being on the edge of defeat, but finding some kind of personal conviction that pulls them out of it. But Demon Slayer takes it to a whole new extreme. It's like, literally I got stabbed and there is a giant hole in my torso, but I got something left still. You know? And it doesn't happen once. It happens like three or four times where Tanjiro loses this and then loses that and they get stabbed in this way and is poisoned by think of my sister you know that kind of thing it's not an issue of kind but degree it's just a lot Arrakis asks what kind of ending do you expect the show to have as I mentioned I think a really key part of Tanjiro's trajectory is becoming the leader of sorts I wouldn't be surprised if in some way he departs from the Hashira a little bit the Hashira might be a stage in his in his journey but he's bigger than the Hashira and bigger than the Demon Slayers, if, if that makes sense. I'm thinking of like an Ed Elric type thing where he's very much a part of his world and a contributor to it, but he also has something that is only him and that is going to be essential. There's going to be some realization there that allows him to beat Muzan. I think that there's probably parallels in the forms in sun breathing and also the fact that Muzan is afraid of the sun. Muzan being this pillar of human darkness, even though he's a demon, it's it's actually human darkness. Tanjiro is the light. Tying in with that, I think, will be the fact that Nezuko is an ally and someone he cares the most about, but is also kind of on a demon path in her way. The more I think about it, the more I think that saving her is not going to be just finding some kind of potion that reverts her. It's going to be a, a thematic thing. There are going to be difficult choices about what is valuable. And so far, family has been the highest thing. But is that it? Is he always going to choose family? Is he going to choose Nezuko above all else? Even general goodness or helping others or service to humanity? Or there's a major storm coming for Tanjiro. There's a big conflict happening. And I think the ending, well, I don't want to go into any more specifics than he's going to defeat Muzan, will include a combination of his goodness, his uniqueness, Muzan's darkness and defeating him, but also Nezuko, a choice involving Nezuko. Artie Knight asks, Zanizu fanboy speaking, he gets slept on, especially early, but did you predict his character development? And what do you think is the next step for his character. So I think I did predict some things about Zenitsu really early on. I definitely liked his character and enjoyed his presence from his very first appearance. I can't remember exactly what I said, but I'm pretty sure I said something about the measure of who he is will not be about how much he complains, but what he's able to show up and do. And I think that is going to be his character arc. There's something really compelling about being that afraid and also something very realistic and very relatable because yeah, we're so used to heroes sort of rising to the challenge and just showing up and being great, but Zenitsu is probably the most realistic depiction of what it would be like to be in the Demon Slayers, where everyone's dying all the time. Like, literally, the lower-ranking Demon Slayers are just cannon fodder. They lose so many people, they rival the Attack on Titan scout's body count, which is saying something. So who would not literally be peeing themselves every moment of the day? Every time you see a crow, it's you go into convulsions. But he has immense courage that's shown, and he does show up, or he has shown up so far, and I think the journey for him, like with many characters, is to take what he has and make it a leading factor of his personality, literally making it conscious 
because he sleeps, right? It's a sleeping aspect of his personality. And of course, maybe most importantly for him is finding a girlfriend or a wife. Oh, I remember one thing I said about him was that a lot of times people use over ruminating on anxiety as their way of doing what they need to do, if that makes sense. There's a way you can ruminate that is self-destructive where tiny problems blow up into huge ones and then that limits action. It's like this thing has become so mon monumentous that there's no way I could even take any positive steps towards fixing it. There's another kind of person that I actually relate to where you want to have all the risks lined out in front of you because sometimes there's something about articulating it that makes it more manageable. It could go horribly wrong and it, it could become bigger than their actual problem, but in some cases, let's say you, you write down your biggest fears or have a discussion with your, your friends or someone you're close to about your fears. Sometimes just having them in front of you in a more objective way makes you realize they're not as daunting as you initially thought. And many of them are, are just excuses. And I feel like that's partly what Zanis is up to when he's complaining or whining. It's his stress coping mechanism. And I think the evidence of that is the fact that even though he's asleep, I don't think he's ever missed a crucial opportunity or let anyone down as a result of his fears. Ryan asks, Tanjiro's character is often criticized as being absurdly pure. We don't see any moral or personal failings besides wasting Udon, which is a big, <laughs> big personal failing. Does he still work as a protagonist, despite having an inner psyche that is almost literally heavenly? Definitely. I think there are, there are multiple ways protagonists can work. Sometimes it involves personal growth, and I think that Tanjiro, he does have that growth element, and that growth element will come from sort of living in innocence to living in ultimate darkness. Having a heart that pure is not always a gift, you know, it's not always a strength, it's a weakness. It's something you have to, you have to cope with and reconcile against the things you see and not be corrupted by them. But there's other characters in which there's no growth involved and that's okay. You know, think of like a Goku character. Goku is pretty much Goku from the beginning to the end and it's great. And the thing that makes it so fun is seeing how other people fall into his gravity. You could say the same thing about Mob to a certain extent. And Tanjiro has a lot of that too, which is fine. I think the part that will make it interesting and compelling is what happens when the ultimate light meets the ultimate darkness, which is Muzan. And also then throw in Nezuko sort of in between them. And you have this really interesting sort of conflict where it's, it's not really enough just to be pure because you have to act in the world and you have to make decisions and there are threats and dangers and there are things you want. You know, Tanjiro doesn't want Want people to die, for example. He's very motivated to protect people, but his heart is only going to take him so far. There have to be corresponding things that go into that, like hard work and making tough choices and deciding if it's appropriate to sacrifice and things like that. So just because he's really great and heavenly, as we've seen in his inner inner world, I still think there's a lot of potential for him as a, as a great protagonist. Is he my favorite protagonist? No. And I think I think there is an element of the criticism that is correct. And I, I have a feeling it stems largely from season one because he's sort of there from the beginning. And I don't really Really know exactly how to explain it, but I think to some extent we want to see things that are earned. We don't like to see things that are good, that have been obtained in what we feel is a manner that's unfair or too easy. And I would say perhaps what comes across about him early on is that the reason he's good is not necessarily character related, but is sort of just anime conventions related. And I think that might be what ruffles people's feathers. But as I've said, I think that's kind of forgivable in light of what else is there and the potential for him as a character. This was one of the big reliefs of me for season two when he started to actually reflect. It's like, okay, no, he actually is human. This wasn't something he just brushed off because he's strong, you know? No, he's suffering from it and he used his suffering to do good things. He focused on Nezuko instead of falling into darkness. He's constantly challenged. He's constantly thrown into despair or potentials for despair. And in fact, he has fallen into despair at times. But then what does he do with that? The choice element of it is what what's satisfying to me, most satisfying. And looking at shows as opportunities to extract things that are applicable to real life, I think that is sort of the, the gold. You know, people are born with varying different dispositions and that sort of is the way it is, but everyone has a choice about how they react to things. So to have a model like Tanjiro where he's basically been all the way down into hell, but he's never hellish, you know, that is great. Oh, and speaking of the flashbacks, you mentioned having the flashbacks before the battle. What do you think the pros and cons of that would be? So I've spoken about the pros of it. I think one thing that would perhaps be lost in that is it's kind of fun to hate the demons at first. It makes it so satisfying when their necks get cut, you know, you just want to see them die it's not a nuanced view it's not the greatest thing or heights of understanding in my opinion but man is it fun right like sometimes you just want to see the bad guy die and then the bad guy dies and then you get the <laughs> sympathetic backstory so you can have your cake and eat it too non commensal question how often do you need to change out the watermelon i see i answered that one too i guess that was a useful taisho fact <laughs> speaking of backgrounds it's funny how relevant that taisho secret was have you considered a throne page or similar so people could maybe donate decorations for the background <laughs> or do you prefer the modern gulag aesthetic now that you've called it modern gulag i'm sort of attached to it but one one of the reasons for my gulag-ish background is one that I'm not naturally inclined for decoration, as you might have guessed, but also because I'm highly mobile. Even in places where I've lived for extended periods, I never knew I was going to live there for extended periods, and I have to travel light. Like every time I move, I'm moving to a new country, which makes it difficult to have elaborate 
setups. Like one thing that would really help me is having a PC and I can't have a PC or I need to invest in like a really, really high end one. That's like a portable PC, if that makes sense. I will check out the site because it seems interesting and I would like to have a better background for sure. It would have to be something that was mobile, like really mobile, really light. But honestly, you know, just the way I'm wired, I know it would probably help me out. Right. And so for that reason, I should do it. So I won't make excuses, but it's definitely not my main focus. Let's put it that way. Sean D asks, if you were Uncle Iroh, what advice would you have for Tanjiro? Perfect Tanjiro. And what qualities would you like to emulate more of? I would tell him a man needs his rest. <laughs> Although he does seem to get some between arcs. I would say something to the effect of, to a large extent, if you desire to take care of the world, that starts with taking good care of yourself. You know, the world would, would be made worse by his sacrifice. It's really tricky because it's also one of the things that makes him great. And you don't want to get in Tanjiro's way. He's just this ball of literal fire or sun and he's pure in his decisions you know if he were to sacrifice for himself there would be not an ounce of regret in his body but i think there's something lost in that equation which is that his life has value too and his loss would be a huge loss for the world and to me maybe more importantly the people around him there's something inescapably selfish about sacrifice even if it's also the most unselfish thing there's a weird duality to it and about what i would like to emulate i think there's not a lot of wasted space in tanjiro he doesn't spend a lot of time overthinking things or over analyzing things it's just what is the good i can do in this moment it's kind of fun you know he has moments where he starts to spiral he starts to you know oh my god i'm losing it but those moments are short-lived and he always kind of catches them and acts from this more observant higher part of his brain or psyche or, or whatever where he can rationalize it and think all right that's how i'm feeling this is rough what is my next move what would be the best thing i can do and then he does it and there's not a lot of gap in between the two things i think i would be made so much better by closing that gap a little bit you know from just thought to drive to action. It's really easy to get in your own way. You know, I would consider myself an overly analytical person and that can definitely bear a cost and being aware of that it's something I have to navigate. It's been something I've been working on for my whole life and have to continue to work on. Benji asks, what are your thoughts on the criticism Demon Slayer gets? People say it's overrated, carried by the animation. Zenitsu ruins the series. These are all kind of extreme. Zenitsu definitely doesn't ruin the series. I happen to like Zenitsu, even if I didn't, he's not always around, right? There are a lot of moments without him. I will say that the animation does go a really, really long way. Like it doesn't hurt that the animation is some of the greatest animation I've ever seen and maybe exists ever. Would it have the same popularity without the animation? I think it would still be a solid show. I'm not sure it would be as popular as it is without that. I think that seems to be a lot of what people talk about when they talk about Demon Slayer and deservedly so. As for the story being unoriginal, I would say that maybe the, the synopsis, the scenario of the show might seem that way on paper. You know, there, there's a, a guy who fights demons, but the devil is always in the details. It doesn't really matter in my opinion what that is for a show it's going to come down to how much it touches at things that are real and significant related to that is the fact that there are always going to be constraints around what those things are you know what things have meaning because i personally believe there is objective or objective ish meaning to human life that is given to us by the structure of what we are as humans and how that flows from the nature of the universe so that's why you see a lot of stories that feel right kind of hitting on similar notes and then it's just a question of like, well, what are the, the edges? What are the nuances of that? How does it approach it? And for me, Demon Slayer does hit a lot of those really sweet spots where it's like, yes, this feels right. This feels inspiring. This feels real. And sometimes it doesn't. And that's fine because overall, I get utility from watching it. To make this really simple, I don't see why it should get hate. Why hate it? I think what Demon Slayer does right, it does really, really well. And so it's not deserving of that much intense criticism. But then again, that's often the case for things that are at the top. Ryan asks, it seems copywriters have not been friendly to this series. Has it been any worse than normal? Yes and no. I would say the frequency of copyright claims has been less, but I think that's also because I've been a lot more cautious since Fruits Basket. The way it's been worse is that, like Fruits Basket, I got a copyright strike for the first episode of season two, probably because of the length. Like, that was a 40-minute episode. I think they were judging it based on total footage shown rather than what it usually is, which is how divided the footage is and how much commentary there is interspersed throughout. So it's been difficult at times. It hasn't been the easiest show, but it hasn't been the worst. It's been more or less manageable. There have been times where I've had to do certain videos three or four times but that's kind of par for the course. As for protecting myself, this is difficult. It's really hard to know because fair use is gray area all the way down. And despite popular belief, there are really no hard and fast rules. Like people believe in these minimum or maximum time things. People use a counter. None of that holds because it's all at the whim of the original holder. And the way YouTube works is they can file a claim for any amount of footage in any format and then arbitration goes to that company itself. And really it just comes down to how reasonable they are and how much they fear litigation, which is not very much. And they definitely would not fear litigation for me because typically what's involved is establishing loss of revenue. And at my level of views on YouTube, the loss of revenue from claim videos is 
not even worth a lawyer. Thank you to all patrons, by the way. So yeah, it's a sort of something you gotta live with it. I can't fight it. It's just the way that reaction videos are and just gotta go through the process. The real concern is not copyright claims, but copyright strikes and getting three of them in a 90 day period. I had two for Fruits Basket that lasted 90 days and that was a harrowing period. Knowing that I'm doing material that's not original and that anytime from anywhere, even from past shows, I could suddenly get a copyright strike that would delete the channel. And if I'm being totally honest, I feel like it's an inevitability at some point. You know, if I do this 10 years, let's say, more likely than not, I'm gonna get those three copyright strikes. What happened with Fruits Basket is they hit me with two, which you would think is double jeopardy, right? It's the same series, but it doesn't matter. You know, what someone could do right now, if they wanted to take me down, they could literally go to my season one, episode one reaction, episode two reaction, episode three reaction, copyright strike all three of them, and I'd be done. And there's a hope that it could go into YouTube arbitration, but because of my size, I'd probably lose. So I've been thinking a lot about that actually, and I'm thinking about how I can sort of back that up because Patreon is what makes this possible. Patreon is what gives me a living from doing this, but YouTube is sort of key for Patreon because that's the discovery for Patreon. And there's a natural cycle of Patreon where there's people who leave and then people who join. But without YouTube, there's no replacement. So Patreon just dwindles. And I've been thinking about what I can do that would sort of insulate me a little more from that. And I'm I'm working on that. And that will be something that I hope to talk more about as the year goes on. Chris Sharp asks, final thoughts on Uzui. Liked him a lot more <laughs> at the end than I did at the beginning. He's sort of an ultimate badass. Speaking of being on the nose, I feel like the whole three wives thing was a little bit on the nose. I think it works sort of as a shortcut in viewers' minds to be like, oh, he's the man. He has three wives. But then he also happens to be great through just being ultimate badass, looking hella cool, <laughs> having one of the coolest abilities so far, being smart, being compassionate, and being nurturing of not only his wives, but of the boys. And what did you learn? What lesson do you think the show teaches best? It's a simple one, but it's hard to articulate how much it meant to me to see the scenes of Set Your Heart Ablaze. Like, literally, I say that to myself at some point every day <laughs> since I watched that episode. It's such a simple thing, but it's also not. You know, it's a reminder of the choice every moment. You're having difficulty? Set your heart ablaze, you know? Things are going well. Set your heart ablaze. You got anxiety. Set your heart ablaze. You got something to do? Set your heart ablaze. I don't know if I would have been able to manufacture that on my own, but having seen Rengoku go through that and having that emotion, that becomes a card I can pull up that has real emotional gravity and weight because I've already been there. You know, the show took me there once and so I can get there again much quicker than I could have if I was trying to manufacture that feeling by myself. And that means it existed within me the entire time or at least the capacity, but these shows, these really intense moments that come around every every so often, they are just raw injections into your bloodstream of that emotion or that state. And there's a muscle memory aspect to it where I've, I've had my heart set ablaze. I know what it feels like, so I can get to it quicker or something close to that quicker. And Rengoku was just a more advanced form, perhaps a future look at qualities that are essential to Tanjiro. And so we're seeing that basically all the time. You know, even before we had such a heart of blaze, we had such a heart of blaze. And so that kind of consciousness and presence in making choices and choosing how to live each day. I think is simple perhaps to hear, but unbelievably profound in practice. Aaron Sarah asks, have your thoughts and feelings regarding the show changed since you began watching it? I think I've touched on this a bit, but season two definitely really broadened out the emotion for me and the introspection and made me love the characters a lot more. The elements of the story are starting to be used in harmony, which is a multiplier on how deep it goes. Oak asks, if I recall correctly, you seem to really enjoy training scenes. What is it that appeals to you about them? And what was your favorite training moment from the show? I just think training scenes do a really great job of condensing something I love in life, which is taking energy and forming it into action. As I mentioned in a previous question, I think one of the traps for me is overanalyzing. I've heard it called analysis paralysis, where I can kind of ruminate endlessly on things, but I love the feeling of taking that energy and putting it into something that takes shape. You know, it's what I feel humans were meant to do. The universe is something that creates, you know, it creates despite destruction and entropy. And so creation, growth is unnatural in a sense, but also one of the greatest things. It is the essence of being itself in a way. And physical training is an example of that that just comes across really well on screen. It's like, this is gonna hurt. You know, this is really gonna suck, but I'm gonna grit my teeth and make myself into something great. I mean, it works well enough alone just thinking about it as exercise. I think it's something that I really value in my life and I will get to be training 2.0 at some point, even though I'm leaving Jeju, but it works more broadly as just action. Action in line with conviction and purpose. Favorite training moment from the show. It was 
pretty short actually relative to other ones, but I really liked the training scene at the beginning of the entertainment arc because they're all working together. They're all sort of aligned in that purpose, which is really cool. But I also really liked the rock training because I thought that there was something really kind of Greek myth about it that added this extra element that was kind of cool. Divya Joshi asks, what is your favorite opening and ending? I have a sense this might be controversial, but I really like the entertainment district opening. Easily my favorite. I had the most fun listening to it, and I also think it's visually the most appealing. I don't have as clear a choice on endings, but I would also go with season three ending. I think just musically, I liked it the best. Also, what was your favorite moment? Set your heart ablaze, <laughs> as you might've guessed. Although, now that I think about it, the demon slaying at the end of the entertainment district arc was pretty damn sweet, so that's a tough one. Yeah, actually, I think I'll give it to that, just because it plays off of Set Your Heart Ablaze. Set Your Heart Ablaze was bittersweet because he was such a beautiful golden creature that was lost, but he set their hearts ablaze and was successful and won, and that's largely why they were able to obtain victory in the Entertainment District arc. So that was there. I think Set Your Heart Ablaze is in there in that moment, so I'll give it to that. And which demon backstory was the saddest? Definitely Big Bro, Big Demon Bro. Martin Van Buren III asks a, a really big question related to Zenitsu. When do you know when to try and escape from something versus tackling a challenge head on? What weaknesses or challenges are actually worth the time? Are there things we shouldn't touch and just let cultivate over time? This is really amazing because I'm struggling with this right now. I've been struggling with this a lot over the past year. As somebody who wants to win, you know, as somebody who wants to take on every challenge and emerge victorious, but who obviously has major deficiencies and natural weaknesses and limits to my personality. So I'm gonna start off by saying that I'm not qualified, but the thoughts that arise are, Maybe this will be helpful for myself too. This actually came up in Mob as well because Reagan was telling Mob it's okay to run away. And there was something about that that bothered me. And I think the question comes down to what are you running away from exactly? Are you running away from the circumstance of the thing? Because I think there's strength and wisdom in knowing when you can't win circumstantially, you know, when something is destroying you or when you're in too deep. Or are you running away from something you've been avoiding? You know, are, are you running away from some kind of truth, some kind of painful fact that if accepted would help begin a path of actually addressing the problem in a, in a really meaningful and personal way. I think you want to escape from bad circumstances, but you don't want to escape from the truth. You know, you don't want to escape from the lessons. And all challenges are an opportunity in that way. Perhaps it's useful to let go of outcomes a little bit because there's just so many things, you know, basically most things are out of our control. You know, even if we do everything right, they might not go well. So then it becomes more a matter of focusing on process rather than result. So like, what could you do that would make you feel the best about yourself and the way you behaved and the way you acted, looking at yourself in the mirror, let's say, even if you don't get what you want necessarily, even if the outcome isn't exactly what you would have desired. Part of being process oriented is taking a longer term view because are you focused on the battle or are you focused on winning the war? If you lose a battle, but have come away from it stronger and better, you are going to win the war, most likely. That war is probably largely with yourself, you know? Speaking more specifically, although I guess still vaguely about my situation, one thing I can say for sure is sacrificing things I felt were right or good about me for the hopes of an outcome never went well, never. First of all, they made me feel terrible. They made me weaker because now I had less to rely on in myself having compromised those things. But also in a lot of the cases, I didn't even get what I wanted. So it was like, what the hell was the point? I think the extent to which escaping a circumstance is wrong will probably correlate with how much honesty is also being avoided or escaped. Let's say there's something that you know would be good for you and feels right, but also is terrifying. To explain it away as being not important or denying your own responsibility for yourself or pretending there are things you can't do when you know you maybe could do them, I think that would be a time where escaping will do more harm than good in the long term. But I think in the situations where you are taking responsibility, in many ways, I feel like the best defense to anything is to aim for perfection, you know, to aim as close as you can to that as possible. That I think makes you more resilient to other things that come because you know, you know, you, you know yourself and you know you've done what you could. So there's not that lingering self disappointment or self guilt or whatever it is that muddies the waters of evaluating circumstance. Crucial in this is being able to be bigger picture thinking. There are some challenges that we get attached to because we think they'll deliver something crucial that we need, but a lot of times there's several layers removed. It's not actually that thing. And in fact, getting that thing wouldn't give us what we think it would give us. It's actually probably more about forming a perception of self, living up to our own expectations. So I think therein lies the answer to some extent some extent. You can't become a different person in an identity sense, but you definitely can change. You definitely can grow. So if you can identify areas where you're doing things that you know are wrong for you, let's say, and think about how you could take responsibility for them and improve them, or things that feel right, things that feel good, and how you could lean on those things and accelerate them, I would hope that the rest would kind of take care of itself. I think those very personal, very self-directed things are probably always going to be worth it. And other things, you know, circumstantial things, those can be physical manifestations or vehicles for those things. You know, it's good to have a backboard against which to evaluate yourself, and that's what life is. It's very easy to conceptualize yourself as a great person and work out all your demons in a room, you know, 
but what are you really in practice when you're facing the headstreams of, of life? So pursuits and challenges and difficulties are useful in that degree, but they're not really what's at core, and that core is the bigger challenge of just what we are, what we want to be, and ways in which we're deluding ourselves, and what the truth is that, if accepted, would allow for a healthier framework from which to build upon, because only from there can you sort of determine where you are and where you need to go. Default Goblin asks, what Hashira are you most interested in seeing more of? Interested in seeing love Hashira. Just, I'm, I'm very curious what that will look like, what the breathing forms will look like. She stands out as one of the more unique ones out of the set. Yuji Zhang asks, why do you think Ume, or Daki, was given a chance to not go to hell? despite her killing. I think it's because demons are not demons. They are representatives of human choice. Human choices that kind of reject the humanity of other people and reject personal responsibility and lean into things that are more self-serving and work less when widely applied to everyone. So things like revenge, jealousy, power, manipulation. The thing with her though is that she died. It doesn't seem like she made the choice to do that. It seems like her brother made the choice for her, which is very, very closely tied into that whole thing of her dragging her down. That's their demon counterpart seeming to have a, a human counterpart. So in a sense, she's more of a victim than other demons. When she kills people, she's already a demon. So that human choice element is lost for her. Yutaro taking her with him to hell is definitely interesting. The key thing in there for me is not so much that they went to hell, but that he recognized and accepted, speaking of which, his own responsibility in the matter. And I think one way of looking at it is not necessarily that he dragged her there, but that she chose to go, which is kind of great because it makes it simultaneously more tragic but also more beautiful. Leonald asks predictions for next season. Yeah, everything has changed. They've beaten an upper ranking demon. Muzan is gonna be pissed. <laughs> There's no hold holds barred anymore. It seems like he's been sort of sending, you know, this demon, that demon out, like, go take care of this sun kid. I don't think there's going to be any higher priority from him anymore. It's going to be all at war. The Hashira are celebrating, but this is a double-edged sword because now they have a target on their backs. Aside from that, I think Nezuko will also become more intriguing as she sort of grapples with this emotional development while simultaneously becoming more of a demon. I predict that they will be a much stronger team. They're going to be a lot more resolute, and I wouldn't be surprised if they start to rise the ranks of the Hashira, and I feel like it'll happen quickly. I have a feeling there are going to be some time jumps here where they end up in more prominent positions. Shabai asks, what would be the main group's hero names if they were set in MHA? The first one that comes to mind is Zenitsu, maybe like like Sleepy Lightning, Night Lightning, Night Lightning. That has a ring to it. Night Lightning. Inuske, Mountain Maniac. Mountain Maniac? Beast Blade. Let's call Tanjiro Sun Slayer, even if he hasn't fully mastered his sun yet. Jeremy Ocasio asks, We've seen upper rank demons try to convince characters to become demons. Will this continue and will any prevalent characters give in to the temptation? Also, you seem accepting of this idea. Do you still agree with that line of thought? So as I said, thinking of demons not as this sort of just monster class or supernatural thing, which it is also, thematically, it's a very human thing. It's giving into very human temptations that allow short-term benefit, even huge benefit, but come at a large cost and that would not work if largely applied across society or across all humans. It's things that are self-serving, indulge our most base needs at all other costs, right? So it makes a lot of sense to me why the demons do that, because people who have gone down into the darkness hate to see people who live in the light, because it's a reflection of what is actually their true weakness, and they especially hate to see people who are uncompromised be successful. So it's either you join me or you die. That is not just in the show, that is in life. If I am terrible and wretched, you are not allowed to be good because your your light literally burns me like the sun burns Muzan. So yeah, I think that would probably be a common thing and I would not be surprised at all if Muzan asks Tanjiro to be a demon. He would be the ultimate demon. And in fact, I don't think as pure and heavenly as Tanjiro is, he's totally out of the woods because he's he has liabilities in a sense. His liability is Nezuko. She is going to become more and more corrupted. Is there a way that saving her relates to him being tempted into becoming a demon or doing dark things? Seems likely, or at least possible, right? Lady Tamayo is sort of a, a, an odd one because we don't really see the compromise, but I feel like just thematically to be consistent, it has to be there. Though to the extent to which I'm conflicted or think it's fine, it's just the extent to which we've seen them kind of be functioning but that was kind of weakened by the ending of season two and Nezuko's incident. James Kelly asks, what are your thoughts on Inosuke's character arc? Really enjoyed it. I mentioned this in reaction videos as well as in this video, but he really impressed me. I didn't think that much of him at first, but he's got a real heart and is also really intelligent. And I like how they depicted that in him without really hitting you over the head with it, like they did with some of the other characters, especially the villains, you know? He's just sort of observing. You see him watching everything. You see him learning. He never wastes an opportunity to take something out. And next thing you know, he's strategizing and he's working with other people in conjunction and rescuing others. You know, when in the beginning, he's just out to just kill anything in his way, slash anything in his way. Joe Martin asks, do you think Tanjiro's kindheartedness is too unnatural sometimes? Is it a good example to set? It's like I said with Toru in Fruits Basket. I think that 
it's great if you really have it. I don't think it's something that is good to fake, you know? If that's really how you feel, you know, if you really have that kind of compassion for people and in your deepest heart, you just love people and want the best for them, then that's amazing. And that's a great example. And I, I can't really think of anything wrong with it, but it's sort of weird to aim for that as a goal because I think that might end up coming out as doing it with an expectation of something and then being disappointed and bitter about it not going well. Because really that path is one of self-sacrifice and destruction. You know, it's the traveler in the forest for those who have watched Fruits Basket where you will get devoured. And you gotta be okay with being devoured. If you're not okay with being devoured, then you shouldn't be sacrificing. You know, you shouldn't be offering up your body parts to the forest demons, but Tanjiro is willing to sacrifice. There's a little element of it. There's a little tinge of darkness in it that makes it intriguing. And that's the fact that there's a need in there, specifically in relation to his bond with Nezuko, because she in a way is his salvation. It's, the, it's like the one thing that pulls at his heart that he wasn't there for his family. So while it's largely pure, it's not all pure. There's a need in there. And that need, you know, that reciprocity is I think the thing that makes kindness end up sometimes biting you in the ass. If you were an up and coming demon slayer, which Hashira do you think would be the best teacher or role model figure for you? I think the person I most need to become is Rengoku. There's something about him that's very different from me and is therefore something I desperately want and would probably benefit the most. There's something in him that terrifies me, which is probably a good sign that it's something I need to learn. About who I would get along with the best, it would definitely be Butterfly Lady. Just thinking about my life, I've always had the easiest time in relationships between myself and an older woman mentor figure. Even recently, like I'm in Korean class to have a visa here and I really bonded with one of my Korean teachers. She became like my mother here in Jeju. And it just happened so naturally. Like there's something about myself and I guess what I'm used to, what I'm, I'm comfortable with, where I fit into the mother-son, <laughs> even though it's weird to call it that, dynamic effortlessly. And in a way where I feel like I'm also really providing. Whereas father figures are a little bit more against the grain but that's precisely why it's so vital for me. Kefe asks about the different senses and which one would be my strongest. I think it is a really nice touch having them have different senses and having their abilities be related. It adds an extra job chart to the whole equation. So there's some fun tactical depth there. For me, without a doubt, my strongest sense is sight. I have really good vision. I can also connect sight to more thematic things for myself, just thinking about me, myself as a person and what my values are. My weakest are smell and taste. I have a very, very poor sense of smell and taste. I'm an undertaster, if you know what that means. Numa Farzug asks, do you think Yutaro made the right choice when becoming a demon? <sighs> Tough. Hard to imagine him not making that choice. I feel like I probably would have made that or worse choices. Was it the right choice? I would say the show gives you a pretty definitive no answer to that question. Because of where it leads him, right? I don't just mean death. It leads to him just being absolutely miserable and even losing the one thing he has of value temporarily, which is his sister. I mean, he has a sister, but also he doesn't, right? That's the revelation at the end of the season with their whole closure episode is him realizing how much he used his sister. Him becoming a demon was just darkness that was already there. In this show, it's Muzan that makes him demons, but also it's not. You know, they, they are already demons in a key sense. This is one of the first times this has happened, but I feel like this Q&A has sort of made me anticipate things that are coming in the future because Gutaro and his sister are a parallel or maybe a preview even for Nezuko and Tanjiro. Are they going to face a similar choice? Is Tanjiro going to be compromised in the same way or is he going to pull Nezuko down in a key way or is Nezuko going to pull him down? There's a lot of ways this can go, but I feel like I'm starting to see this is more than I thought. This interaction was more than I thought it was at first. So yeah, that is the end of the Demon Slayer post season two Q&A. Demon Slayer was short, but I had a lot of fun with it and I feel like I got a lot out of it. And I am very excited to see where season three goes and beyond. So yeah, I will see you next time for Jujutsu Kaisen.